Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. Today I'm interviewing Mark Jones, who works in mortgages. Mark, welcome. Hi Jack, nice to be here. You want to tell the audience a bit about who you are? Yeah, so um, so I'm mortgage advisor. Um, so I own my own company. Um, we're a directly authorised business. Uh, we've got a couple of advisors um, in there with myself and my business partner. And um, we do. I mainly concentrate on mortgages. Uh, so we do a lot with first-time buyers, self-employed people. Uh, and then my business partner spends a lot of time with equity release and more specialist cases with buy to lets, HMOs, uh, and stuff like that. So we're generally an all-round company, um, but we specialise within certain subjects within ourselves um, for each advisor. And you, and what is the name of the company? So the company name's Jones and Young, and we're based um, in Petersfield. And what made you want to start that business? I always wanted my own business, and that was probably uh, the biggest driver. Um, it naturally fell into place once I became a mortgage advisor, I was employed for years. Um, then it became the natural progression. Always wanted my own business. I was a mortgage advisor. Um, I suppose, in a way, for mortgage advisors, I think most mortgage advisors will eventually end up, if they stay in the industry, owning their own business um, and becoming self employed. For the way that um, sort of salaries and stuff like that is calculated, uh, then it does become a bit more lucrative. So if you've got any type of wanting to be a business owner, then it does fit very well um, with that. And you said you were a mortgage buyer previously. How did you get into that industry? Yeah, so I, for myself, I worked in hotels um, when I was younger and uh, came across a lot of mortgage companies um, that would rent out the conference rooms and do various seminars, stuff like that. So it's something that interested me then. Um, I quite enjoy chatting with them. I like the energy around it. I like the sales aspect of it. Um, then to be able to do sales and advise people at the same time. So in a way, every mortgage advisor is a salesperson because of the way that we get paid. So if you're employed, you'll get a basic salary and then you'll get paid a commission. If you're self-employed, then you get paid, um, you know, commissions. Um, so having that element of being able to have that potential of earning whatever you want to earn, what you put in, what you put in, you get out. Um, but then also being able to help people and advise people what to do, then ticks both boxes. So, um, so it, that's, I suppose, the way I looked at it. And what would you say the day-to-day -day role is compared to, A, just working for a business as a mortgage advisor and then going to actually being the owner of, biz owner of a business that advises on mortgages? So that's the biggest difference is that when you're employed, and this is where I think I struggled when I first became a business owner as well as a mortgage advisor, the, the roles, are, you've almost got to split yourself down the middle because you've got one element that's the salesperson we just discussed and the um, uh, the advisor, but then at the same time, you've then got your marketing, you've then got your organization, you've then got the meetings with the lenders. There's so much more in the background once you're the business owner that as an employee, all you're doing is the phone's ringing, you're picking the phone up, you're helping that client and you're starting that journey with that client obviously that's really important because if that employee got that journey wrong with the client then it, you know it's not going to put the business in good shape but that's only half the journey for that client to ring the phone for the employee to pick it up it is literally half the journey once you think that that business owner has had to put all the marketing into that has had to do you know even podcasts stuff like that to build brand awareness. There's so many more elements that go into it than actually just mortgage and giving the advice. And did you have to go through a special sort of training in order to sell mortgages? What was the path to actually being able to do the job, having the skill? Yeah, so a lot of it is like anything in this world, I've got a certificate that says I'm qualified to give mortgage advice and that you do need that 100%. And um, there's a lot of regulation. Um, there's a lot of compliance. So without that, you would have no grasp on what the importance of that being correct is. But actually, a lot of it's more just people skills. A lot of it is a lot more just the um, interaction with the customer needs to be important. At the end of the day, the customer doesn't understand the regulation and all those elements. So you need to be able to explain to a customer 
what that is. Um, and that takes skill. Communication is one of the biggest skills you need. Um, and the rest of it is, um, I suppose, more experience, knowledge. Um, but very little of it is, I suppose, on the actual certificate and the qualification. I think it's one of those jobs you really start learning once you get get your feet under the desk and you start um, start actually speaking to customers. And I ask this question to a lot of people who have worked in property, whether it be mortgages, service accommodation, buy to lets. How has your business affected by the pandemic? Obviously, being one of the biggest changes to um, affecting businesses in well, at least the last century. So for us, it will be completely different uh, because of the stimulus packages and everything that the government did. So because they cut the stamp duty, they um, obviously gave people grants and there was a lot of money within the economy because of bounce back loans. The housing industry, I suppose, boomed. Uh, they were definitely boomed. And because we're part of the housing industry and people need mortgages to buy a house, then naturally we've done well, in all honesty, I don't think you would have seen a mortgage company in the last couple of years that haven't got an element of growth. And um, the big companies would have massively grown. Um, and that certainly trickled down to the smaller companies like myself. Um, but saying that we're about to hit our hard times is what I feel, because everything that happened was artificial. And now we've got to deal with what the fallout is from having all of those things that took place. So I think if we are to have a hard time, I think that hard time will be over the coming years um, rather than it was during the pandemic for people in hospitality um, and those types of leisure industries. And where do you see, you say we're look, looking at hard times, where do you see this industry going? I know there's obviously in the country right now, new leadership, new laws taking place, interest rates. Where do you see the mortgage industry going? Um, in a way, it depends on what happens with that and what decisions are made, I suppose. But at the moment, I did a remortgage for a client um, last week and they were on a two year fixed rate. So we put them so they bought a house two years ago. We did the mortgage for them then and we did a two year fixed rate. And the rate was about, I think, 1.79 in and around there. We've just come around to do a remortgage and the rate is now around three and a half, three point seven. Mm -hmm. That's a direct impact because of the base rate going up and the Bank of England increasing the base rate. So it's hard. It's going to cost people in the economy more to borrow what they could have borrowed two years ago. In that case, it's quite a significant jump. So his mortgage, I think, went up uh, by around £300. That depends on how big your mortgage is, what the initial rate was. So there's a lot of sort of variables within that figure so i suppose it's a, a, a crap stat to give in all honesty because there's a lot of variables but his mortgage gone up 300 quid any household in the uk doesn't matter what you're earning having your mortgage going up by 100 150 200 300 is going to have a direct impact especially when you've got heating going up um you've got cost of living going up anyway with food and stuff like that to have your mortgage payment going up as well is going to be difficult so um you know, I'm no economist, but I've only got to look at my own house to understand that our day to day cost of living is going up and what we used to live off and our budgeting to run our house, feed, shopping, clothes has certainly gone up. So if I don't start earning more money, then naturally that's something that's going to come out of my disposable income and naturally have a hit on the house. So it's difficult, isn't it? Every house is going to be different. But if everything was to carry on the way it is currently at the moment for my household, then yeah, we're, we're going to be close to, I don't know, three, four hundred pounds difference a month, um, which how many households in the UK can cope with that. So you think that could be a domino effect? Yeah, it'd have to be, wouldn't it? There would absolutely have to be a domino effect because that's, that's the way the world goes. Yeah, 100 percent. And unfortunately, like anything in this world, it'll be the people at the bottom that will probably feel it the most you know it's that middle ground as well isn't it you know if you're not you know you've got really you've got rich people in this world haven't you that don't need to worry about this at all then you've got a hell of a lot of people in the middle that need to rely on an employer need to rely on businesses to earn their wage no one 
I don't know if I see a lot of household incomes and structures. I don't see a lot of savings. I think the days of having savings isn't really what it used to be because interest rates were so low. So no one really had savings. So we don't have those reserve funds to call upon. So then what happens when you can't afford your car payment because a lot of people have leased cars, the car gets taken away. The knock on effect of a car being taken away as you get into work. The knock on effect of you being late constantly for work is losing your job. Or it could be the other way. The business makes you redundant because there wasn't any, um, you know, there was no growth in the business or they were starting to lose contracts. So, yeah, there's math. Yeah, there will be a domino, domino effect. That's the way it happens, isn't it? Well, with that outlook, would you still recommend somebody who may be doing a job previous to what you used to do to start their own business in mortgages? I think you can't. Um, I could never answer that because it would depend so much on them as a person. You can start a business at any time. And if you've got the motivation, the never give up attitude, and you're going to drag yourself out of bed on those really dark days when everything feels against you and go and find a new contact, go and do your networking, go and do the basic things right and keep yourself visible on social media, then I would never tell anyone they couldn't open a business in whatever climate. Because I think a lot of it, and from what I've experienced with me and my business, I think a lot of it is about mentality and about getting the right things done rather than the climate that you're opening your business in. Because as a mortgage company, I would be very surprised if we had to fold because of the coming, you know, because of what may come with the economy and stuff like that. So that would then mean that anyone could start a business and survive you know, at the end of the day, if they've, if they've got the right tools, the right resources, and they're willing to go and find those tools and resources, then yeah, crack on. Well, you've talked about where you see thing, where you see things going, but what about yourself? Where do you see your business going in the future? Um, so for us, we don't want a massive business. That's not what we're in it for. We don't, we feel that from working in those bigger companies, I wouldn't want the advice. There's a, if you look at the really big companies that hundreds, have hundreds of advisors or even sort of 40, 50 advisors, 30, 40, 50 advisors, then the, the advice is naturally going to have a big difference. So it would depend on how the quality of advice would depend on who picked up that phone. I wouldn't want a company where that can be jeopardized. So um, you could pick up, you could ring certain companies of a certain size and you might pick up to a trainee and you might get a really good experience or a really bad experience. You could pick up the phone to a um, to a really experienced in, um, advisor, but maybe their heart's not in it anymore. Do you mean there's so many variables with having a big company for the advice? For me and my business partner, what we see is a company, one of having, um, I suppose, a small set of advisors, but of a certain makeup, and a certain way of the way that their values are and the way they want to deliver their advice. I wouldn't necessarily want salespeople, although like we discussed earlier, you need to have an element of sales because a large part of your income is made up from commission, but you don't want out and out salespeople that are sales driven because then the advice falls down to one side because you can in that, my industry get paid more money for doing the wrong thing. So then you need to be careful there. So, for me, it would be having a smaller company that we can really get involved with and actually keep being part of rather than it getting too big. So it's out of our values. And then the not everyone in the company has the same values. So that would be more important for us and having a solid company. Also adaptability, as you just said, we haven't had a pandemic. We've got a rough forecast for, um, for the economy. We would want to be adaptable. The best way to have be adaptable is by being smaller and niche. We don't want to be a mainstream broker that takes everybody. We like working with first-time buyers. We like working with self-employed people. We like doing different bits with different advisors. That, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we enjoy doing. So I wouldn't want to take the company away from doing what we don't enjoy doing. So it's, um, it's more about values and having adaptability for us than going large and making millions and having this um, we want a brand but we want a loyal and an honest brand rather than it just being a you know a brand that everyone knows 
Um, that's that's a very good answer because a lot of people I interview is always just um because I, I know a guy who's trained his own business and he says he wants to be a millionaire, grow as much as possible, but I mean in five years retire to Dubai. He's always about we want to grow as big as possible. Well, you're talking about if you expand too much, then you can use the value that your business currently offers in the niche market. Yeah, hundred percent. So we don't look at our business as being a business that we would necessarily sell we may get to a point where we look at it and we go oh let's sell but we wouldn't have that type of five-year plan of retirement what we look at our business is is a business where we can take an element of money out each month to nicely have a nice lifestyle live a nice way and invest in other businesses maybe and do other things but at the same time we would want to keep hold of the company and keep the reins of the company for the value that it delivers and the best way we can secure it keeps paying us month on month is by having an adaptable business that's still small and agile enough that we can actually adapt it as we see fit so for us we would be more interested in having a business that would pay us a large sum of money that we necessarily don't have to be there every day nine till five on the telephones but would prefer a business that would still be in our ownership and still within our means to do what we want to do with it, rather than having a business that we're going to make of this mad beast of a business, get loads of advisors in, on the phone that don't fit our values, get bums on seats, get leads, get loads of traffic to it, absolutely just make the figures look really good and sell it. That's you not wouldn't sit with our values for what we want to do because the advice, the amount of customers that would be stitched up within that process and would have mortgages that weren't suitable, would be paying mortgages, you know, that, that just didn't help them to get to their goal. Don't forget our business is a mortgage company. Our business is actually a business that's set up to help the client get their goal. So if you're a first time buyer, our business is set up that your goal is to get a mortgage not for us to make money the uh, the fundamental bit of it is is that the first time buyer gets a mortgage so they can get their first house which is actually their goal so it's a different dynamics to i suppose just being a product that we sell and so somebody because you mentioned earlier in the interview how you got how you got qualified to sell mortgages you had a special certificate saying you did that was it a specific course the company that you worked for offered or is there a website people saying that I want to, I've heard the smart guy talk for the last 20 minutes. I think he's absolutely amazing. I'd love to go in a similar industry. Where do I go about learning the stuff this guy knows? Yeah, so it's a CMAP certificate. There's three exams, one, two and three. Um, you do your first exam and then uh, there's different units within that exam. Uh, but you do that first exam that then generally gives you enough to start being in a, in a role where you can start speaking to customers and um, depends on what company you're with would depend how much their freedom they would give you with just level one um, and then you do two and three which then builds you up to be able to give full advice and um, be fully compliant um, and competent advisor have you got any words of wisdom for people who take your advice and do go into this industry um, I suppose not really. It's just stick with it. It's not really about a wisdom. It's more about if you want it, you'll do it. There's many bad things like there is in any industry. And if you weren't fully committed, you'll find those bad things really quick. It is about being an employer and getting the right employer, I suppose, um, and stuff like that. Uh, I think that massively helps. So I think everyone's experience would be different. So don't give up try if you're not enjoy if you do get into it and you don't enjoy the first company you work for because it may be too salesy then don't give up those companies like us that don't necessarily want sales people so you know don't give up would be the only answer you will get some is finance there are a lot of idiots in finance you can't avoid that and um, there's a lot of people that are there just to make money so i wouldn't get into mortgages just to make money I don't think it's that type of industry. I think you'd be found out fairly quick. So don't get it into make, you know, there's other ways you can make money. And um, if you want a good solid career and have a lot of loyal clients that will always ask for your help, then it's a perfect job. And with that, Mark, thanks for coming on the podcast. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Brilliant to be here. Cheers, mate. Cool. And that's a wrap um so i um i wasn't expecting this interview to, um when i was doing it when i used to do it via zoom they, i usually have the person's face so what i'm going to do is because this will um say to my computer as also an audio file 
So do I have your permission, whether it be, whether it be a LinkedIn profile or something you send me to, when I'm editing the photo, add a picture of you to the side perfect. where you're not currently? Would that be okay? Yeah, perfect. It's only I need I need a visual image, otherwise it's a bit more difficult uploading to YouTube because you can't just upload audio files. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's fine, mate. Yeah, just do whatever you need to do. And I'll also release it separately in clips and send it to you as well. Okay? Perfect. Thanks very much. Cool. Well, I um, know you're busy, so I'll leave you for the rest of your day and hope you enjoyed the edited interview. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye.